According to the Los Angeles Times, composer and performer Eve Baglarian is a humane, idealistic rebel and a musical sensualist. A 2017 winner of the Alpert Award in the Arts for her prolific, engaging, and surprising body of work. She has also been awarded the 2015 Robert Rauschenberg Prize for, from the Foundation of Contemporary Arts for her innovation, risk-taking, and experimentation. And hopefully all, all you students have read her full biography and you, you can get to that if you haven't. It's, it's quite fascinating and is a very um, long prestigious career. Uh, so um, thank you so much and I'll hand it over to you now, Eve. Thank you so much, Glenn. And, and I'm really happy to be here with you all. And Jane, it's so great to see you. So yeah, um, I'll give you a quick sort of capsule biography of sort of the trajectory of how I became a composer and all that. Um, but I wanna sort of get to music sooner rather than later. So I'll try to do it super quick. Um, I was, um, I grew up in a musical family. My father was a composer. My mother was an organist and harpsichordist and pianist. Um, my father actually got the one of the first DMAs ever given by the University of Michigan back in the day and was a prize winning young composer, you know. Um, uh, he had come to this country actually from Iran um, and uh, and then ended up at, at the University of Michigan. Um, and he eventually became an academic and at a certain point became the Dean of the School of Performing Arts at the University of Southern California. So I grew up in Los Angeles from when I was about 10 until college and was surrounded by all these emigre classical musicians who had landed in Los Angeles because of the Second World War. Um, so that older generation, like my grandparents' generation of musicians, were people that I grew up with. They were sort of like my step-grandparents or something like that. Um, and it meant that I was exposed to a huge amount of classical music from a very young age. I took piano lessons. My mother actually taught me the piano and she was a very awesome piano teacher, actually. I didn't have that terrible thing with studying with your parent, you know. But the, but the bad side was that it was a very limited idea of what being a musician could be. And it meant sitting in a practice room for 10 hours a day. And that was not something I wanted to do with my life. Um, I was interested in a lot of different things. And also, yeah, so I went off to college thinking I was going to be a brain scientist. I was really interested in neurobiology. And oh, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, I'm in Vermont. Um, and um, so I went off to college to study neurobiology. And I was there for like, I don't know, a month. And I realized, wow, I've made a really terrible mistake because I grew up in a situation where music was just everywhere. It was just part of the daily life. And to suddenly be thrust into this environment where I'm like doing calculus and chemistry and, and, and not surrounded with music and musicians, I was like, oh, this will never do. And so I decided to switch to music. And luckily, or yeah, luckily, I was at Princeton, which meant um, switching to music meant doing really nerdy, math heavy music study, right? Like the first year you did a species counterpoint for like an entire year. Um, just to give an example. And 12-tone music was ascendant in those days. Um, so in a way, it was sort of science-y, which was a great transition from my science nerd head into doing this kind of music. 
But it also became clear to me that I was not going to be a 12-tone composer when I grew up or whatever. It was a wonderful apprenticeship, and it gave me the chance to sort of bang it bang up against something sort of cranky making, which was really useful. And I learned a lot from that. Um, so yeah, so then I went to Columbia for grad school and I really hated Columbia, just to put it bluntly. Like I had a terrible time there and I, I quit after the master's degree. And I was like, you know, I'm done with academia. I'm done with that career path. I'm done with being an academic composer. Like, that's not for me. And so I'm, I'm in New York and unemployed and at a loss about how I'm going to proceed or what I'm going to do. Because even more than now, I would say the career path was to become a professor. Like, that's what you do if you're a composer in America. Um, and I knew that wasn't going to be my career path. So I realized I had all these skills of, like, editing tape from doing tape music, you know, at the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center or whatever. And so um, I got work as an audiobook producer in the early days of audiobooks being a commercial phenomenon. It was just taking off in the early 80s as a thing. And so that's how I supported myself for like 20 years. And um, the exciting thing about that was we were moving into digital editing. And so I was able to buy Pro Tools in like, when would that have been? 1993. So I'm like bleeding edge early adopter of Pro Tools, which was an incredible gift. And it paid for itself because we were paid in those days um, on a piece rate that ass assumed that you had to cut tape by hand. So buying Pro Tools paid for itself in like, I don't know, two jobs or something. It was like, because it was so much faster as we know, well, as, as I know, because I still remember editing tape, but as most of you probably don't know, because you've probably never had that experience. Um, and that's fine. I'm not one of those old school people who's like, you need to edit tape, you know, no. So anyway, um, so fast forward, I was a really downtown, composer and then performer. I gradually started performing because once I got away from the idea that, you know, the only way to be a musician is to be like Yasha Heifetz, you know, or Gregor Piatigorsky or Horowitz or something, um, then I realized, yeah, I can perform and there are things I can do as a performer that are effective and did not require 10 hours a day in a practice room for 10 years or whatever. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I moved downtown and I'm performing and composing. I had a band for a while called Twisted Tutu, um, you know, sort of warping the classical, right? Uh, um, and, and everything was great. And then I'm really going through this fast. At a certain point, I realized I don't need to subsidize. I don't need to be my own patron anymore. I'm getting enough commissions and I have enough performances, enough royalties that I can live maybe less comfortably than I, than I did with the freelance work of audiobooks. But it's also splitting my focus and I wanted to put my focus just on composing and, and performing. And so I quit doing audiobooks sometime around the turn of the millennium. So I missed the whole podcast revolution. Like I, I podcasts weren't around when I quit doing audiobooks because that's the logical, of course, next step is podcasting. Um, yeah, so then sometime, yes, 
in 2008, I sort of had a meltdown with respect to my New York life that was partially due to a delayed reaction to Hurricane Katrina, um, which sort of politicized me in a way that I had not been quite so politicized. And also the economic crash of 2008 and also the election of Obama. And so in 2009, I decided to paddle and bike down the Mississippi River from the headwaters all the way to New Orleans. And I spent four and a half months doing that. Um, and then the next several years, writing pieces responding to that journey, which in a way has generated more projects and more like it, it has sort of colored, I would say that my compositional life divides into before the Mississippi and after the Mississippi in, in some really big way. Like that was a life-changing experience. And, and I'm, yeah, it's really, yeah. And the Mississippi is really cool and really is the spine of the country and really will, well, one of the things that it changed my life in in understanding is that the line we have between nature and culture is in fact an artificial line and that the Mississippi has huge geophysical importance, of course, in our country, but it also has huge cultural and political importance in our country as well. And if you think of it purely in musical terms, without the Mississippi, without the 1927 flood, without Katrina, like music that grew down there in the Delta, the blues, and in New Orleans, early jazz would not have moved north and become urbanized and become the music it is, right? We would be living in an entirely different cultural world if it weren't for the Mississippi River. So it's really cool to think about. Anyway, that's too much. I talked too long, so I'm going to stop. Um, what I was going to share with you today is some of the things I've been making during lockdown. I left New York City uh, on March 8th um, by chance and to come up to Vermont where I have a place. And I basically haven't been back. You know, I, I sublet my apartment in New York. Thank God I found some subletters who want to be in New York during lockdown. I stayed in Vermont and have been making stuff long distance and, and also solo. And so the first thing I'm going to show you is so solo. And it's the first thing I made uh, uh, in lockdown. And I will try to figure out how to do this well.
black mold in my room makes me feel like the walls are learning something. Tell my computer falls in a forest. That's fine. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, this is bad. I I hit. I need there now. I can see you. That's better. Um, thank you. Yeah. So I made that, and I haven't been able to re-record it. Like in a certain sense, it captures just the moment that moment and what it felt like to be in isolation. And, and like, I was like, you know, there's cars going past and, you know, I didn't mean for it to be the final version, but somehow it's become the final version for now. Maybe, maybe with some time, I'll find a way to, uh, to revisit that em emotion and be able to bring it forward. But it's sort of an interesting issue. Oh, and that reminds me, the text is by a poet named Crispin Best. So, and it showed up in my inbox, you know, one of those poem a day kind of things. Um, and, uh, and so that's when I set it to my four chord music. Okay, the next piece I'm going to play for you is called I Have to See You. And it's a duet that I made with a friend of mine named Lucas Pappenfuss Klein. And it's based on um, a ballad by the 14th century composer Guillaume de Machaut. Um, I have a series of pieces responding to the music of Machaut, and this is one of them. And um, we made the videos separately, you'll see. And uh, but the video, so we we made the video separately and I never put it together until like a week ago. So I think it's still on private. So you're seeing like no one has seen this or very few people have seen this. Um, so let me do this again. I'm going to do it. Hi. Hi.
So the thing I should have told you about that is that when we recorded it, I gave Lucas the drones that are underneath, which are me singing, right? But there's no click track. 
So you basically sing the phrases as you feel them. And, and so while we're singing in inversion in that third section, we're never exactly together because we're not in the same space, you know? When you do it live, live, the two people can feel each other and they are seeing one another, right? So there's a sense that this version with its wonkiness in the counterpoint is proof of how distant we are, right? Is, is living into that distance. So it gives me pleasure. It gives me real pleasure. And I love that Lucas, who's a real singer, launched himself, themselves, totally into it, you know, in this awesome way, which it's easy for me to do because I'm not really a singer, you know. I just play one on TV. Ah, ha, ha. I shouldn't have done that. That was bad. So you can't, you can't make jokes on Zoom because you can't hear anybody laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a terrible feeling. You're like, oh wow, that was really dumb, you know. I'm fascinated by by the vocal style. I mean, it's so un it's 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 so unpredictable that someone would approach a, a you know, usually almost, there's 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 some there's something formal in a vocal performance you know, that it seems so guttural or, or visceral, you know, and, and kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, from, from like a more primal kind of place. Uh, and, and how was that, I mean, did you conceive that? Was that spontaneous or was that, and, and it was so fascinating how not just the timbre, but also like the notes and the, the you know, the, the sort of microtonal improvisational aspects that were so fascinating, you know, between the two of you. And then how you got so soft and musical at the end and really together. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's, there's a misconception about medieval music in particular that it was sung by, you know, sort of head tone purist monks with no vibrato and no feeling, you know, and and those all those 90s chant records sort of sort of came up with a house style that I think bears absolutely no relationship to what medieval music probably sounded like. Oh, wow, right? that's really interesting, yeah. Um, and I'm not in any way claiming that this is what medieval music, you know, my, what my show sounded like either. I mean, I don't know, and I'm certainly not an early music specialist, but the sense in which it, it, it sounds what we call Middle Eastern to our ears, um, to me indicates something about it being rooted in a in a sort of expressive style that in fact if you're like real historical ethnomusicologists know that that stuff traveled all around and so what you hear in Sean Nose in Ireland and what you hear in North Africa and what you hear in the Middle East and what you hear in Armenia are all related actually to a form of music making that that comes way before my show for sure. Um, and so I think of it as being, you know, intrinsically musical, if you will. I mean, not to be arrogant about it, but I mean, I think that it's a you know, it's an expressive way of uh, of expressing oneself, and and we can do it. We can all do it. You know, it's not like it requires again ten hours in the practice room. Yeah. Uh, I found it really cool that um, 
like you used uh, the headphones in the video, like was that a conscious decision or was that just kind of out of necessity? Because I, I found it kind of like symbolic because it's like the music sounds very old and like medieval and like kind of primal in emotion and just kind of letting out the feelings of like how painful isolation is. But like combined with the modern image of someone on a camera with you know, headphones over Zoom or whatever. Yeah, I mean, part of it was the practicality aspect that that we needed to um, hear the drone while singing, and we didn't want to record the drone from the room. So we needed each of us needed headphones in order to be able to sing the 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 piece, and. And it was a choice really between, you know, advertising Apple or advertising Sony and, and whatever Lucas's were, I, they weren't Sony, they were <laughs> right. something else. And so, and Lucas had chosen the big ones. So I chose big ones to match, you know, it, it was sort of just a visual thing. But the other thing that I think I should mention, I mean, to me, this is really interesting my show, this particular ballad comes from a book called Le Voir Di, The Real Story. And the real story is purported to be love letters sent between my show at age 80 and a young aristocratic woman, girl, we would have to say, of 14, mm -hmm. um, who started writing fan letters to my show. It turns out it's actually far more complicated than that. The young woman wanted to learn to write poetry. And so, and they've actually, and so when, when it's called Le Voir D, it turns out it's really true because they've done a statistical analysis of the poems that are purported to be from Tout Belle, which is her alias, right? and those that are purportedly by my show in the book itself. And they are in fact different, different writers wrote them. And so it is, and there's all this like secret stuff about where the aristocracy was spending the winter and stuff like that, that all lines up. And so it seems very likely that Lavoardi contains actually the love letters that were written as apprentice works by this young poet, which are then responded to by my show. And it's a whole educational mentoring thing going on, right? And they're not actually having a, you know, March, December relationship or whatever. Lucas is 25 and I'm 62. And so when, but the difference is to, to like, picture that in the back of your head as, you know, we're going to pretend that we are, and, and we're both queer, right? So like neither of us, it's not actual, nothing of that longing is romantic sexual longing at all, right? Right. But when you sing that way and you're this close to each other on the Zoom, when I started to make the film, I'm like, oh, this will never do. Like it is beyond creepy because without the graphic novel filter, here's 60 whatever old me <laughs> singing to Lucas like, oh my God, I'm dying for you. And 25 year old Lucas <laughs> singing to me like, oh my God, I'm dying for you. And it was like, no, we can't have that. It's like, it's, it was, oh. It's it funny, was oh bad. my gosh. Yeah. Wow, that's funny. That's interesting. And then I think, actually kind of like the graphic novel uh, filter over it afterwards even more because that kind of uh, that makes it more universal and like it could be it could be a relationship between any two people regardless yes. of like yes regardless of romantic or sexual interest it could just be yes. that we long for anyone yes yes exactly and and it also subtracted the too realness, you know, the like TMI-ness of it 
got moderated by the graphic novel part. Right. Gotcha. So, That's really cool. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thank okay. You. It's like 258. Oh no, we go to we go for 15 more minutes. Yay! Because I really want to show you this last piece so much. And in fact, I have two versions of it, but I don't think I'm going to have time to show you both versions. Sometime in December, I had this revelation that the person who could teach me about living in isolation fruitfully, especially in New England, would be Emily Dickinson, who famously lived in isolation. I mean, not exactly isolation, but, but you know, uh, lockdown, you know, quarantine, if you will, um, and wrote 1,700 incredible poems, right? So I thought, okay. And I had never really done a deep dive into Emily Dickinson. And so I felt like this is perfect. It is time. And so, and I mentioned it to a few individual friends, all of whom said, oh, that sounds really interesting. And so we put together a small study group of like five people. Um, it, initially, it was five people that we called Queer Emily, comma, role model. And we set it so that we would meet at sunset um, in Amherst, not physically, but like we, there's a thing that will tell you what time sunset is anywhere in the world. So we would send out the Zoom invitation. I would send out the Zoom invitation to start, like the first meeting was January 11th at 4.34 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because that's when the sun set in Amherst. And now because of uh, you know the way the sun changes and time change, it's now at like 7.04, you know? So like gradually as the winter has proceeded, our, our gathering time has gotten later and later. And, um, and so we started studying Emily. And it turns out there are unbelievable resources online if you want to study Emily, because you can get all the original manuscripts uh, have been scanned and are available and cross-referenced. And it's like awesome. It's like the most fun thing in the world. And, um, and in addition to her actual poems, there are also fragments that are generally called, you know, sort of envelope poems that are written, some of them are written on wrapping paper, some of them are written on recipes. There's one that's written on a concert program. And, um, and it's really unlikely that Emily actually attended this concert, but it's possible that her sister did and the program was in the house. And on this concert program, it, she has written two phrases. The first is, of our deepest delights, there is a solemn shyness. And the second is, the appetite for silence is seldom an acquired taste. So, and the program shows that one of the pieces that was performed at this concert was um, the first and second movements from the first organ sonata of Mendelssohn, a piece to which I was not acquainted. Um, and so I looked it up and I found a, a really beautiful phrase um, um, in the second movement. Um, and, um, and so I sort of abstracted that into this piano thing that um, is, is written out as if it's a continuous piece, but the performer is free to stop and insert silences wherever they feel it. 
and and that's completely open. And I think of it as sort of like how a deer is grazing in the in the woods and then stops to listen, right? It's sort of that kind of feeling. Um, and then we decided to make a movie. Oh, yes, there's a movie for it. And the movie for the premiere performance, which is the one I'm going to show you because it's shorter and it'll give us more time to talk. Um, uh, and it's the premiere. Uh, the film was made on my land in Vermont on the evening of the inauguration. So for me, it's a very um, fraught film because it's like that sense of relief that that I felt and I imagine many of us felt um, um, when the actual inauguration had actually taken place, right? Um, and there was a big snowstorm. And so I just left my camera out there and it captured the snowstorm. And the performer is Lara Downs.
Yeah. So it's so interesting. I should share, I'm going to share the other one. Uh, I'll do it. Uh, I can share the other one for you, um, which is more recent and it's using rain instead of snow. And instead of having the eyes and the hands of the pianist of Lara, um, Eleanor filmed the inside, the innards of her piano. And so you see the hammers moving up and down in rhythm. It's stunning. And it's in a totally different way. It's a very different um, feeling. Oh, th thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I can send, I'll do it later, but I can send you the, um, the link to the spring version. And, you know, and I know that another pianist is taking it on. So there'll be an early summer version, you know, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this because they, they just have a very different feeling depending on what the video is, um, for sure. And then the secret that I'll tell you because you're music people, I've processed the, um, the ambient sound. So at the beginning, it's just the pure ambient sound. And gradually as the piece continues, I add a high E flat resonance so that you as a listener really can't tell the difference between the E flat that's coming from the piano and the E flat that's now emerging from the ambience. And um, Eleanor Sandresky, who, who did the spring version, she said to me that it, it was real. she like for sure recorded with the ambience in her headphones because that experience was really cool for her as a performer and that it, it ended up coloring how she treated the silence, which made me really happy because that's what I was planning on. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm reading the chat. Oh, very awesome. This is awesome, Colin. Yes. No, these envelope poems are incredible. I really recommend. And there's a website which is called Gorgeous Nothings. Um, and not only is it just beautifully, beautifully done, but like the scholar, the woman who's doing most of the work around all of this is just so insightful and thoughtful. I, I just have huge respect for the people who are doing it. Yeah, yeah I'll just jump on and say hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I bought that. She also made a coffee table book version of yes. it, with the transcriptions. Yes. And so I think when we do the critical edition of the score, we're going to try to get the permission to put the image in the score as well, because he cites maybe four or five of the different envelope poems. And in the score, he'll say this is from A105 or- Oh, cool. Very cool. Yes. <laughs> oh, that sounds wonderful. Well, well awesome. thank you so much, Eve. I mean, we're at 115. I don't want to just cut it short. Ahead, oh, I was just going to say, there's such a, there's uh, so much visceral, like uh, Glenn used the same word, that visceral um, ritualistic connection this this very sort of spiritual physical uh connection to the earth happening in all of these pieces um really there's a there's a profoundness in the simplicity as well there's a, <clears throat> such a depth into it all so i really want to thank you so much for sharing well it's my great pleasure really i i i really appreciate it's really fun to be able to play the most recent stuff, you know, mm -hmm. it, it gives, because I'm most connected to it, of course, you know, and, and so it's a pleasure to share it with you all. And thank you so much for having me.